what do we know about ourselves? What are we learning about ourselves? And what did you learn in writing this book? The, the legal system has differential impact on different kinds of people. If you're like me, when I was young, I was caught shoplifting, shout out Montgomery Mall. Uh, and instead of having the police called, the security called me. They didn't call the cops. They didn't do anything formal. If I was Roger, I'm not sure that would have happened. So it starts at even the lowest level. And we've decided that defending yourself and having connections is kind of like a commodity. So if you're poor or if you're black and you don't have all the connections to power, then you're expendable. And we do warehouse people like that. And I think that as soon as something bad starts happening to white people in this country, we perk up a little bit. As everybody who watches the show knows, the entire purpose of the show is to have conversations with really smart people who are doing really important work. And the big question of the show is when, not if, when you guys are really successful at the work that you're doing, how does that impact our society? going forward? What's the Delta for 10 years, for 25 years, for 50 years? So it's one of my great pleasures and honors to be able to reach out to my network. And, and I'm blessed. I'm put in a position where there's so many really smart people that will pick up the phone when I call. This is a little different because we've gone beyond just picking up the phone. These two gentlemen who are on our show today, we've been working together for the last couple months because they've got an incredible book coming out. We talked about that important work. And in lead up for the book, we've teamed together to create their podcast so that the message that's on the pages comes to life and we get a sense of who the writers are, what are their intentions, what's their background, what do they find funny, what makes them laugh. So today, on the Black Futurist, I welcome my two good friends, Dr. Roger Mitchell Jr. and Dr. Jay Aronson, the authors of Death in Custody, book coming out this fall welcome to the show guys no it's good to be here what's up what's up b how are you how did we know that roger's first word was going to be no we knew it <laughs> we knew it we, the reason we knew why do you 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 really pick on this guy way too much we knew it because the real thing was yes so he starts with the no. That's right. he's Just a contrarian i give myself no's oh man it's deep yeah, man. I don't know what it is. We're going to have to do something about that. It's more gonna... like a nah. You know what? Why doesn't Jay just introduce himself versus uh, versus I, coming I, for your boy, right? You don't need to come for your boy. You know, <laughs> I'm an easy target. Jay, 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 Jay how are you? Yeah. I'm doing really well. And, and before Brendan decided to, like, come straight in with some sort of insult, I was just thinking that we know Brendan, or I know Brendan at least, because he picked up the phone when you called. So it was like a nice little reversal that we needed a really smart, smart ass. Am I allowed to say that on this uh, <laughs> on this podcast? Smart ass yes. producer who would kind of keep us in check and um, really understand what we wanted to get out of a podcast for our book, what he needed to do to keep us on track, how to get the best out of us. And so yes. I, I think we're here repaying the favor. <laughs> um, and, and we have to be, you know, I, I'm glad that Brendan doesn't really know quite enough about me to, to, to give me stick. Um, you can use yeah. the S words. You oh, can I use can all use the words S -word to, to give me shit, to take the piss out of me, as the Brits would say. Um, so I'm going to reserve some of who I am so that he will go straight to you the next time we're on the podcast <laughs> with his, uh, with his stuff. It's still, it, yeah, I'm still getting it, I, you know, even from you. I'm getting yeah. it from you right now. <laughs> so we've been working together for a couple months for sure. And because of the production schedule, it's been fast and furious. It's like, look, we, let's get it done. So we had several days over a series of weeks where you guys were either my first call or my last call of the day. And it just felt like a more frequent check-in than I would normally with, let's say, even groups of friends. So it became like <laughs> a nice foundation for a relationship to understand who you are, what you're about, what you went through that day. So that's been fantastic. And 
listening to all the recordings that we've done on your topic, which we're going to get into in a second, what I haven't been able to do over all this time is interject. I'm never part of the conversation. I'm, I'm a witness. I'm the fly on the wall. I have the best seat in the house. But today, you're on my show. The gravity's changed. This is 0.9 Earth gravity versus 1.0. Things are a little different. The physics might be a little changed. So <laughs> we're going to talk, talk. Let's start with who we are. And I'm gonna, I, I could read your bio, I have it here, but it doesn't make sense. So Dr. Roger Mitchell, you're already on the screen. Would you give us just a little about yourself? And if you don't go hard enough, we may embarrass you and have to brag on you a bit. So I, I recommend you go in and tell people who you are all the way, sir. Well, I was born as an eight point three ounce. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm uh, Roger Mitchell. I'm from Jersey, born and raised. Um, and I went to Howard University B. That's where we met uh, mm -hmm. in the 90s at the height of hip hop. Uh, and I left there and went to the FBI. I was a forensic biologist there. I was one of the first black forensic biologists in the country uh, at the FBI. And then I went to med school, did my med school at Jersey Med in Newark, did residency um, in George Washington in pathology, uh, ended there as chief resident, did my fellowship in forensic pathology at Office of the Chief Medical Examiner in New York City, um, worked in Houston, Harris County, ran all death investigations there, um, was the youngest chief medical examiner in the country back in 2011 when I was the acting state medical examiner in New Jersey. Um, then did seven years from 14 to 21. It was the chief medical examiner in Washington, D.C. Um, and then uh, for the last two years, going on three years, I've been the chair of pathology at Howard University College of Medicine. Just recently, the chief medical officer for all adult ambulatory care. I wrote a book before this one called uh, The Price of Freedom, A Son's Journey that talked about uh, my life-saving approach to my father who was crack cocaine addicted and the importance of forgiveness, man. And I'm married, man. I'm married, man. 21 years this month, three wonderful children. And, uh, you know, I'm enjoying it. And then this newest project, right? Deaths in custody, how America ignores the truth and what we can do about it. We can talk about my background in forensic medicine and how that has played itself with death in custody. But, that's the hopefully short but braggadocious. You, you skipped one part. You skipped two parts, actually. One, you just dropped your daughter off to college yesterday. So you're also maybe dealing with some separation anxiety and, and all those kind of things. You might be impacted on this conversation. You I understand. What? You had to you drop her off. I get it. Wow. <laughs> and you were wow. a Howard University campus pal, which I think, you know, you should have mentioned quite early in your here. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. the Campus Pal piece, man, we're, we're bringing y'all back. So mark, right. mark your calendars. Campus Pals are coming back. And, you know, there's things that I tell you in confidence, B, that, no. you know, now the whole black future knows about it. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. it's good for you. It's, it's, it's good for you. I do it for your benefit. Uh, yeah, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. You know, I love you, brother. Known you I for love 30 you too. years, so. Dr. Right. Jay Aronson, you're up next. Now, Roger went super hard, and I know you said that you've got some things tucked away that I don't know enough. Right. So I'm the spotlight probably, is on you. Hell no. I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not divulging any information. I have uh, no personal private life. I only work. I'm just kidding. Uh, so uh, it, it's uh, one, one rule that we're going to have to have whenever we do these interviews from now on is that I get to introduce myself first because when I go after Roger, it's like, I, I'm kind of a nobody. Uh, I don't have much going on. So, I mean, it's just, it's, it's been amazing to work with Roger. I'll say that. Mike, um, would you uh, introduce yourself, uh, please? Uh, I, I will. I'm Thank going you. in reverse. Uh, I've also been married 21 years, have three wonderful children, dropping the first one off to college next week. So um, it's going to be interesting on all levels mm. when, when we do that. Uh, I am a historian, a historian of science and technology by training um, through a very long series of very minor twists and turns. I have become a human rights practitioner. Um, we would have to spend many, many hours or minutes at least, which I don't want to do, going through all of the different things that happened that, that led me to where I am today. But I've been working uh, on human rights documentation and how science and technology can help improve the way that we record and document human rights violations, initially in uh, in 
I actually started in the American criminal legal system way back around uh, the use of DNA in in post conviction cases where people claim innocence and DNA comes in and maybe offers scientific proof that the legal system got their verdict wrong. Um, but most of what I have been doing is in other countries in South Africa, in Bosnia, in Ukraine, recently Syria, looking at how video and other technologies are changing the way that we um, find out about bad things that happen. I, I had realized at some point, and I was just when I met Roger six years ago, uh, I was beginning to question my decision as a kind of Western researcher going all over the world, looking for human rights violations and not really looking in my own backyard. Mm. And it, it, it was beginning to bother me. I think there was a big critique in the human rights community uh, about how, you know, white Western men and women find fault with other countries and the US is certainly not a, a perfect place. Um, and it was also at that time that there were videos of uh, police killings and videos of police brutality circulating widely in the United States. Uh, this was the beginnings or the kind of peak of the Black Lives Matter movement before the George Floyd incident, you know, George Floyd murder. Uh, and I was beginning to notice those videos in the same way that I would notice what was going on in Syria and what was uh, uh, circulating from many African countries and other places. And I asked Roger at a meeting, you know, after meeting him for the first time, I just kind of asked him offhand, like, hey, I've been seeing all of these videos of police killings. How do I know what kind of context I should be putting them in? How common or rare are these things? Do they happen every day? Do we know the entire universe of police killings and police brutality because they're caught on camera? Like, what's going on here? And he told me, we don't know. Mm. And I was like, hold on. This is the United States. We're a democracy. We're, you know, supposedly the greatest country in the nation. And we're no better than Syria and South Africa and Ukraine and, uh, and, and Mali. Like, we don't have the information and data that we need to understand how many people are being killed by the state in the right. quote unquote most advanced democracy in the nation. And, and that, that really, uh, it, it, it changed the way that I saw things. And from that moment on, um, you know, I was, I was quite surprised. I, I had ideas that maybe the data wasn't that great that we were getting publicly, but I really fundamentally thought that there was information somewhere at some level of government about how many people were dying in custody. And it was just a matter of, they didn't want us to know, so they didn't share it. But in the United States, the government at all levels intentionally fails to document deaths in custody. And, and I was shocked. And uh, uh, Roger needed to get some food because he, I think he had come straight in from DC to Toronto to this meeting. And he said, you know, come have a beer and I'll tell you a little more. And after two hours, he had convinced me to write a book with him. And uh, maybe I'm a lightweight when I'm drinking and I agree to things I shouldn't. <laughs> or, or maybe Roger just laid out a really important problem that I couldn't look away from. Uh, I think it's the latter, but you know, maybe the former has something to do with it. I was actually emailing with someone who Roger knows last night. And basically, they said that Roger is an extremely persuasive individual. And I said jokingly, well, I agreed to write a book with the man after two hours. So um, that's, that's kind of where we are. The beautiful thing is it was the right question to the right person. Like that moment mm -hmm. was written. That was supposed to happen. You, Cause you could have asked me that question and I would have had what seems to be now the wrong answer, right? Roger's answer was the right answer because my answer would have been, yes, yeah, it happens every day. This is my living experience. But that would have been wrong because it's only one person's view versus really the macro view, which was what Roger was giving, which is we don't know. We, the greater we versus his own personal or my own personal experience. So I think that's incredible. And it reminds me of a story, it's how important these cameras are. Five, six years ago, there was an Uber in Manhattan and the Uber driver was uh, a South Asian man. The person in the back was a South Asian man. And there was a car whose door was open blocking the street. And there was a, a white bald headed gentleman blocking the, the street in Manhattan for an extended period of time. And the Uber guy honks his horn, and it turns out the guy in the car is a policeman. So he comes back to the car, and he starts berating the driver. 
about, you know, hey, this is who I am. This is my role. This is what I'm doing. Uh, I could take as much time as I want getting my stuff out of the car. Uh, don't you honk your horn, da 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 And the guy in the back, being sympathetic to the driver, recorded the whole thing on his cell phone camera. And I remember when, um, when that circulated, I had no shock or surprise at all because this has been my living experience. But friends of mine and people online were totally shocked. It was like we're living such disparate experiences that we didn't mm -hmm. see this same truth happening in both of our lives until – I guess the proof is in seeing, right? So that's incredible. So you guys are writing a book. You have written a book together. It's coming out. Raj, I know you. I know Jay was saying a whole lot. What was pinging in your brain as you were hearing his recollection of your story? No, I, I, there it is again. Yeah. Um, but but what what I enjoy about what has transpired between Jay and I is the openness of both of us trying to find the truth within within this this project and the back and forth of it because the end result of the project is not how we started we started going in a different direction in how we wanted to approach the book we were going to take each chapter and base each chapter on the phases of the death and custody from you know the pre-arrest phase and all the way through incarceration and tell stories at each phase of it and we were looking at a different publisher. And th so, so there was a lot of kind of movements and where we found ourselves now is just where we are celebrating the journalists and the advocates that have taken it upon themselves to tell the stories and be the voices of the voiceless, the voices of those individuals that have died at the hands of law enforcement or due to the neglect or the poor policies of the criminal legal system. And so I think that you're right. You know, we were on a panel that had nothing to do with death and custody. We were on a panel. Uh, I'm, I'm a mass fatality management expert, if you will. I know how to set up those systems to respond to large scale disasters that lead to large amounts of fatalities. We did it for COVID. And I was doing a lot of that planning. And Jay's first book is really talking about post 9-11 access to DNA and, and some of the major issues surrounding the post 9-11 victims. And so we're on this panel and I'm listening to this historian that has a mastery of biology and science and technology. Yeah. And this is the top of, I'm, I had just finished leading a, a group of forensic pathologists on how to perform autopsies, investigate, and report death in custody nationally. Uh, I just finished writing that paper, and I knew that I wanted to write the book, right? I knew that I wanted to uh, start writing the book because it needed to be written. But, you know, I'm the practitioner, the technician. I'm not the writer. I, I speak yeah. better than I write, and I don't even speak that well. So, so when, when God put, you know, and I'm a believer. So when I'm sitting on a, a, a panel with a guy who I recognize, right? I recognize Jay. Nice. I recognized him because I grew up with Jay, even though Jay and I, he grew up in suburban Maryland. I grew up in suburban New Jersey. I recognized him because I grew up in a community that was mostly black and Jewish. And so I recognized how he talked and walked and um, kind of his, his movement. And I, and I was like, wow, I want to get to know him better. Mm. And I want to know what makes him tick. I want to know what drives him um, because I think that there may be some synergies just because I felt like I grew up with him. Um, and, and lo and behold, it is the truth, right? You know, we have very similar kind of approaches and views of the world. And I think that's what's made this project, um, not only the book project, but the podcast project uh, and our friendship so unique. And I, I hope that when people consume it, even so, so powerful. Also responding to you and what your response would be of your own personal experience I have learned and have looked for years 
of objective ways to explain my personal experience. Mm. That's what that's as a physician, I knew as a as as someone who's been in science and uh, I knew that nobody's going to take what I say seriously if it's passionate and it is based in my own emotional experience as of a black man, right? right? Like I could do all that, right? And do when it's required. But I knew that I needed to find a way to explain objectively what is going on surrounding interactions with law enforcement, interactions with the criminal legal system, and the poorest outcomes surrounding that. And the poorest outcomes our death, right? So that's the poorest outcome. And so I've spent my whole career trying to understand the poorest outcomes of interactions with the criminal legal system. And now we've created an environment through my research on the science side and through this book. This is objective. Anybody that reads it, no matter if you're red, blue, doesn't matter what you, when you read it, you're going to say, what? Are you yeah. serious? We got to do something about it. Yeah, it's, it's great the way that you explain that. You guys had a foundation beneath both of your feet that plays out. In the way that you just explained it, you said, I was looking for a way, basically paraphrasing, I was looking for a way to present and validate my personal experience in a way that the science world, maybe the medical world, maybe the political world, maybe the governmental world would accept it. And we had a subjective, you were looking for an objective way, we had a subjective expression of that of the experience that you talk about in the book already and that came through groups like nwa it came through hip-hop mm -hmm. it was we're re reporting in our very subjective and entertaining way our personal experience and the fact that groups like nwa and others uh karis one etc were able to mix in with entertainment their message about their experience reached you both in your respective suburbs of Maryland yeah. and Southern New Jersey and many other people and planted this seed that then after you get all this education, you're able to take that subjective thing and mix it with your own experience and say, now I'm going to create the objective way that science world can, can accept these, this information. Mm -hmm. Talk about hip hop. Talk about that shared language, that, that substrate beneath your thinking and how that provides a connection for you both. Yeah, I, so I, I will say as the the white suburban kid that I I, I had a like a, a rough childhood, not not financially or um, or communally, but as an individual, I had a, a difficult childhood. And hip hop was a, a place where I could go and listen to people who faced adversity and spoke about it and processed it, not always in the best way, but also managed to find joy to seek solidarity. And so th there was that, I think that's what drew me to hip hop first. Uh, I learned so much. I, I mean, I was a biology major as an undergrad. I never took history. I never took sociology. I took some anthropology classes. Uh, my understanding of the, the, the kind of socio-political landscape of the United States really came through hip hop. Like I learned from living color, uh, open letter to a landlord about what it meant when white speculators came into black communities and bought up property. Uh, I, I learned about police violence from NWA. I learned about systemic racism from KRS one, and I could go on and on and on. Um, and I, I don't really think I fully got it until I formally studied some of this stuff. But when I started reading sociology, when I started reading the history of the real history of the United States, I was like, hold on, I already knew this stuff, but, but I learned it in verse. And so it really struck me. And the only other thing I'll say about this is that when I was listening at the time, I still had that kind of bad apples perspective that we had a redeemable system and all we needed to do was get the racism out. And once we got the racism out and kind of purified it, it would work. But the system is at its foundation racist. It's founded on racism and classism. And, and the, the classism, if you're white, can be overcome, but the racism never can. And so I think that like actually really getting that, and it took me a long time, it took me decades to really fully understand what I was listening to. 
um, th that's kind of where I am now. The only other thing I just I just wanted to say, you know, Roger recognized me as the Jewish kid who he grew up with in Princeton Junction or whatever. Um, you know, he understood my culture, however you want to put that. I grew up in a community that had a relatively small black population, um, but I was friends with a lot of black kids in middle school. Like we were good friends. I hung out with them all the time. But by high school, there was this thing that happened and that all of the black kids kind of separated across class, actually. In Montgomery County, where I grew up, there's a little community called Scotland. Um, I think it was a farm at one point that was turned into a project, basically a tiny little project because they probably had to put that there at some point. Um, so there was a tiny little housing project um, that was lit up 24 hours a day. Like you could read a book at two in the morning <laughs> in Scotland because God forbid, you know, people sell drugs there or whatever. Um, but the super rich kids and the kids from Scotland all kind of went off and formed their own worlds. And the white kids went off and, you know, did what they did, white and Asian kids. And so I, I lost, actually, I don't want to say I lost friends, but I, I didn't have black friends in, in high school. I didn't have the black friends I had in high school that I had in middle school. But I recognized Roger in, in my, like, you know, middle class uh, black friends who, who had to straddle the world of whiteness and blackness on a daily basis. And, and I remember some of that. Like, I'd go over to my friend Sean's house and see Ebony and Jet. And I would never see that at anyone else's house. Um, but, you know, he kind of lived in a dual world. And so I, I, I think I recognize that in Roger, that Roger straddles the black world and the white world and has to, doesn't have a choice. And we've had millions of conversations about that. So I just wanted to say that, Roger, I recognized you too. Um, uh, I d had no idea that this was going to be the result of asking a, what I thought was potentially a stupid question. But here we are. So back to you, Roger. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, don't. Everybody can see why me and Jay kick it, right? I mean, you know, when he's calling out an unredeemable system because of its foundational elements being racist, um, you can see how you can write a book with a, with a man like that uh, yeah. about such a subject as death in custody. And, you know, my grandfather was... Uh, a black physician in, in 1932 and my grandmother, uh, a black nurse in 36, you know, on my mother's side, my father's side's people fled to New Jersey after killing a group of white men who lynched my triple great grandmother in Wrightsville, Georgia. So as a, you know, kid growing up in South Orange, New Jersey, and then Princeton Junction, New Jersey, I knew who I was. You know, I had the stories of free blackness in this country and, and struggle and educators in my family and physicians in my family. So I was clear on my trajectory at eight years old, I knew I was going to be a doctor. And so I saw success. I saw what it was, but what really flipped my life upside down, um, was the crack cocaine addiction of my father in the eighties. And it was the crack scourge that was not only at my doorstep, but in my bedroom and in my dreams at night, <laughs> right? So yeah. it was it, the, the scourge of crack cocaine that really birthed the hip hop that we know today was my reality. And yeah. so as a young black man, even with all of the foundation that I had in freedom, I'm still looking for an identity because black mm -hmm. mothers and fathers were getting arrested for being addicted. And so I wasn't the only one. I had multiple friends that their father or their mother was addicted or their brother was addicted or, you know, they were in jail. So I listened to the art form that showed me my own reality. And then in looking at that art form and listening to that art, I found an identity for sure. Yeah, for sure. And it was back when hip hop, you know, was the b boy in the graffiti, the DJ and and the MC. -ing. So I was, I was flavor flave in every room. <laughs> so we talk about my ability to influence people and, and wanting to encourage people to be their best. Boy, I was the year boy. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> that was my role. And then when the when the seas parted, 
and it was time to dance to the music, I was on it. You already knew how to do it. You had seen it. I, I it had been modeled I, for you. I, exactly. I'm here with it. Yeah. Right. So hip hop is hip hop is my culture. That's my culture. You know, I'm Baptist Christian in my religion, but I'm hip hop in my culture. So there's nothing about me that's not the hip hop culture because of how I grew up, my friends, my mindset. We said that we could be something before we were it right yeah. in hip hop. We told our truth in a way that people could understand it in hip hop. And what I've always, my response to hip hop, and I've, I was keenly aware that hip hop was telling me what to do. Hmm. So the art was instructing me to do something. And so that art that told me what to do said, hey, we need freedom. See, I, I grew up in the freedom era of hip hop, right? So there was a there was a little bit more of a balance. Now there's still a balance. Now you can find it in real hip hop. You can find it. But I was being told that I could be a doctor and be hip hop because Red Man was the funk doctor. Spock and wore a stethoscope, and you know he showed me that it was okay to be a doctor if in hip hop. And I have that rap magazine framed in my office, right? Um, but KRS One and uh, poor righteous teachers um, and artists like that told me that we needed to fight for freedom, right? We need to have consciousness. We needed to educate ourselves. We needed to move things forward. NWA told me that, hey, listen, we need to fight against police brutality at every, at every step. So I said, guess what? I'm going to do that. I'm going to use my MD to do that. Yeah. Right. I'm going to use my education to do that. And so for Jay and I, this is the remix. You know what I'm saying? It, it is a, a remix to the lyrics and the art form that has suggested that these inequities needed to change. And so we have used our careers to understand the inequities first and then engage the inequities um, in a way that is just as braggadocious, just as arrogant, just as uh, formidable a a and resolute as hip hop is, right? Yeah. This book is not patty cake. It's not a patty cake book. This book is calling from the first sentences. It's coming right for your neck. This is hardcore hip hop. This book is hardcore hip hop. You know what I'm saying? And, and brings it to you right in your face. I got to call you out on a thing. Yeah, tell me. First of all, I heard the story about your great, great grandparent being lynched. And I've heard it more than most people because in editing, I, I will hear every word you say maybe five to 10 times. And I heard you tell that story in episode two, the Ida B. Wells episode of Official Ignorance, which is the podcast that we've produced together. But you casually left out at the end of that story until just now. So I want you to retell slowly a little bit of detail about what happened after <laughs> the initial telling of that story. So your people got back at those who did harm to your family. In what state was this? This was Georgia, uh, Wrightsville, Georgia. My people still have a, a church out there called Mitchell Grove Baptist Church. Um, and the sons of the triple great and the husband of the triple great were like, nah. They identified who? They identified who killed um, who killed the triple great. And the story is that we took shotguns and we killed at least three of them. Mm -hmm. And then it was, you had to get out of Dodge. So right. there are people that left and came to New Jersey, went down to Florida. So there's Mitchells that in, in, are in the Carolinas because I think there were seven of the guys, seven of the sons. Um, and Doyce uh, Mitchell, which is my grandfather's father, was one of the ones that fled, D-O-I-S, Doyce Mitchell. And he came mm -hmm. up to Elizabeth. And there was another brother who changed his name from Mitchell to Wright, from Wrightsville, Georgia. And he's also a brother cousin. Um, and he came up to New Jersey and changed his name. But the, the story where I think it gets a little bit flamboyant is that one of the brothers went back for one last thing in the house and he hid in the chimney 
and those that were looking for my family were walking through the house and couldn't find anybody. And he, he then was able to get out the chimney and run just before someone took a shotgun and shot up the chimney. Now, you mm. know, no one really knows that right? because <laughs> <laughs> he was gone, right? Yeah. But, but that's the story that's told on the lap of my grandfather, Buddy Mitchell, who's a World War II vet and uh, was 5'5 five, five and could bend steel with his hands. Right. Um, he, he taught me how to box. He was a phenomenal, phenomenal man. So anyway, that's the story. Thank you for that. I needed that yeah. because you, you left that out. That was yeah, wild. Brendan, I, I was actually like, the minute we got off this podcast, I was going to be like, whoa, 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 whoa. whoa. Yeah. I, I you don't wait till you get I, off the podcast I, to ask that question. I, I've, I've, well, I, I was going to say, I've, I just, I never heard that part of the story. That's like the hip hop part. That's like the, the badass uh, 70s movie, <laughs> hip hop, like, uh, we're going to come get you. That's uh, the black, you know, that's the black like the futurist biggie. part. Right, the, the Biggie Smalls uh, version, you know, where you end up with a red laser dot on your forehead. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, it, and and that that is that straddle, right? So the straddle yep. that you talk about, Jay, is to understand what you tell where, and why you yep. tell what you're telling. Right? There's nowhere anymore in the internet era. It's everywhere. Everything is no, everywhere. No, but it, yeah. But it really. But it's it still really situational. Isn't. It, it is. really is still situational. It really. It really isn't because um, the people that listen to you will listen to us. And we hope the people that listen to us will listen to you. Um, but there are people that will only listen to yeah. the official Ignorance, Death and Custody podcast. Yeah. And there are people that will only listen to this. And, and at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's it, oh my God, it's so important for your listeners, for our listeners to understand that you can use whatever is been given to you to be able to affect change, right? So whatever your, you know, whatever your talent is, you shouldn't be scared to use that to affect change. And I think that Jay was doing that with his human rights work and is still doing that because he started a, a course on violence at Carnegie Mellon. I mean, he started a center on human rights is yep. the, the beginning of a center on human rights in Carnegie Mellon. I mean, he talks so much trash about what I've done versus what he's done, but he, you know, he's a founding director of a center on human rights at, at Carnegie Mellon, like not at, you know, Middlesex community college, like no shout out to Middlesex. Right. But, but I mean, big, big deal stuff. Um, but he's using his passion I would say it even some of his trauma like I have to be able to formulate impactful, impactful stuff. And, and this book is that this podcast, your podcast, but you know, B you're doing the same thing. Right. And um, you know, I just want to encourage people that are listening that there's nothing too small or too big to take towards impact. We, we telling, we're telling the black futurists he's on mute. Wait, he's on up. mute. Yeah. Uh, Let me see. <laughs> you're so you're so that. you're so used to muting yourself when we're talking. Oh, that. uh, that's crazy. You, uh, <laughs> I love you, that. It's like, oh shit, this is this yeah. is not. I'm about to take ignorance. over I'm the not whole the producer, I'm the guy. Yeah, uh, I'm taking over All this right, whole podcast. I just I'm gonna take <laughs> it over. I'm your new white host of the <laughs> podcast. <laughs> that's great. Hey guys, right. I want to ask a question about, um, let's say America. And Americans, even though we're talking about a global thing, but the book is kind of about the numbers not being present in America. And that is, number one, do, do people care about what happens to a person once they're incarcerated? Or let's just start with incarceration, because that's at least all the way, right? Not even just roadside pulled over, which is kind of, from what I've learned from you guys, custody begins even there. Or are we a society that just discards people once they've been deemed guilty of something? What do we know about ourselves? What are we learning about ourselves? And what did you learn in writing this book? So this is a great question. I was actually being interviewed on another podcast. Um, uh, and, and the topic of that podcast is mostly uh, public defense. And w one of the things that we talked a lot about was that the, the legal system has differential impact on different kinds of people. Um, and if you're like me, when I was young and had a difficult childhood, I was caught shoplifting, shout out Montgomery Mall. Uh, and 
instead of having the police called, the security called me or called my family and said, come get your boy. They didn't call the cops. They didn't do anything formal. And if I was Roger and that happened to me, I, I'm not sure that would have happened. Um, so it, it starts at even the lowest level. And we've decided that defending yourself and having connections is kind of like a commodity. So if you're poor or if you're black and you don't have all the connections to power that white people do, then uh, you're expendable. And we do warehouse people like that. Mm. And, uh, and I think that as soon as something bad starts happening to white people in this country, we perk up a little bit. Um, and you see that exactly with the opioid crisis. Yep. Um, th the dealers were big pharmaceutical companies and doctors and big pharmacy chains. And the people who were harmed by it most visibly were white people, even though just as many black people are harmed by it. Uh, but we see white victims and so suddenly we care. So we've decided as a people that certain populations are expendable. And if they don't have access to power, then we're not going to worry about it. And that's exactly what's happened in the context of the criminal legal system. As the opioid crisis happened and as more white people have kind of seen what's been going on in the criminal legal system, we've seen some calls for change. But it's only once it affects the dominant population that is seen as the population that matters. We could obviously go on for hours and hours about this, but we've decided that certain people are expendable in this country. That's the bottom line. That's the, that's the point. I want to ask you guys this key question that is when you're successful at this effort, when you've got uh, hundreds of thousands of books sold and people have digested the message and downloaded the podcast and understand why you wrote the book, how does that change our society 25 years down the line? How are things different? Well, I think we know how many people are dying at the hands of law enforcement and in our criminal legal system. So 25 years, we know um, we're capturing. There's centers all over the country that are looking at the data. Um, there are fatality review committees all over the country, state by state, that are doing deep dives into why individuals are dying um, in and around the criminal legal system. And there's federal funding, philanthropic funding, and research, as well as programs that are dedicated towards preventing these deaths and individuals are getting better care while they're inside the system. So healthcare delivery has been improved. Um, uh, suicide prevention is improved. How we handle our individuals by law enforcement has, has improved. And we see a, a huge decrease in how many people are dying in and around the criminal legal system. Once we know how many people are, and yeah. to and to Jay's point of, you know, part of this whole work is to get people to see individuals that are incarcerated as themselves, to humanize individuals that are uh, associated with the criminal legal system. And once we start humanizing these individuals, like the opioid crisis, like maternal mortality, like infant mortality, once we start humanizing the problem and showing that it's not just poor black communities that are suffering the effects of interaction with the criminal legal system. It, uh, it is all Americans. And we show that in the podcast. Uh, we show that in the book, that it's not just one type of person who's impacted by connection with the criminal legal system. It is this whole country and we need to start paying attention uh, to the people who are dying at the hands of our criminal legal system. In 25 years, my hope is that we've replaced criminalization with care, that the vast majority of people who are incarcerated, the vast majority of people who end up under arrest need care. There are some people who are just bad and evil who need to be removed from society, but the vast majority just needs someone to care for them and to provide them with care that they can't access themselves, can't afford, don't know how to get. Um, and that's what I really hope comes out of this book. I, I don't want to have institutions that are giving better meals and um, not beating people down and uh, and giving them decent health care. I want people to live in their own communities and get all of those things. So good. The book is called Death, Death in, in Custody, Custody. How, America How America Ignores, ignores the Truth and What yeah. We Can Do About It. Dr. Roger A. Mitchell Jr. and Jay, I didn't know your middle initial was D, Aronson, PhD. Thank you so much for joining the show. And uh, we'll see you guys at the bookstore. Awesome. The, wait, Thanks wait, so much, you got to you got to announce the podcast too, B. Official ignorance, official ignorance, the death and custody podcast, and it's going to be on all podcast streaming 
coming the, soon. Uh, that's right. Coming soon. So uh, for those of you, and then we just found out, Jay, we just found out that our book is going on Audible. It's going to be an audio book. It's going to yeah. be you guys, audio Who's reading book. it? We're getting samples of people reading it soon. We don't know who's going to read it yet. Not you guys. You guys aren't going to no. do it? No. You got the mics no, already. We no, got sir. mics. When do we go? I don't have time to read that damn book. I, I've read that book enough. I'm not going to read it again. <laughs> <laughs> hey, guys. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. And uh, I'll see you at the book launch. And I'll listen to you every week on this lovely podcast that I might have awesome. had a little bit to do with. <laughs> Thanks so much, Brendan. All right. Thank you so much, Brendan. All thank right. you so much, bro. Thank you, guys. Bye.